Hi, this is Roger Moore, and you're listening to James Bond Radio. Welcome to James Bond Radio, the comics of Bond. Um, I am your host, Jack Lugo, and I'm excited for today's episode for two reasons. First reason is I am joined by a co-host for the comics episodes for the very first time. And um, uh, you, you, you all know him. He's my fellow JBR00, the incomparable Dan Gale. Hey, Dan. Hello. Hello. How are you doing? I I'm all right. I don't, don't even know what incomparable means. Is, <laughs> is, it, is it good? It, it means no, no one compares to you. Oh, comp- yeah, comparable, of course. Yes. yes. So, um, yeah, you're, um, I, I'm so glad you were able to join me for this interview. Um, I, I had a blast speaking to our guest, who uh, is none other than Mike Grell. Uh, for anyone who doesn't know who Mike Grell is, Mike Grell, um, in, well, he has a, a, you know, a distinguished career in comics, but uh, for, uh, in Bond, he actually, he, he adapted the, uh, the License to Kill as a comic. Um, that was the first of, one of the first things he worked on. And then he also um, uh, wrote and illustrated his very own uh, Bond original story comic, uh, Permission to Die. So, um, which I can see in the background behind you there. Yes. So it was a three issue comic and, uh, we're about to learn all about it. Um, I, full disclosure. I never actually got the third part of the, uh, uh, comic because there was a delay as we will find out during the interview, there was a delay between issues two and three. So, uh, I had read one and two, uh, 25 years ago when it came out. Uh, oh, it's nearly 30 years ago now. Oh, I'm so old. Um, but I have still never seen the third issue. So um, now that we've spoken to Mike, I'm going to have to do something about that. Yes, you are. Um, it's it's definitely, um, you know, the best Bond comic um, I've come across so far. So um, I think uh, we're all in for a treat. And, um, uh, you know, uh, I had a fantastic time talking to Mike. And, um, you know, I think everyone's going to enjoy this episode. Uh, it's it's definitely one of the favorite, uh, one of my favorite interviews that I've, that I've been able to take part in. Uh, because because it, because it is so visual, obviously we want to uh, yes. encourage people to watch it on YouTube as well as listening. So if you are just listening to it, check it out on YouTube, on the JBR uh, YouTube page, uh, and you'll get to see some of the artwork uh, that we're talking about with Mike. That's um, right. Works better than just using your ears. Uh, yes. So uh, if you're listening to this on iTunes, you may want to uh, go over to the YouTube page and uh, watch the video because uh, I'm going to have Tom embed some of the images that we're talking about. Um, I'm also going to post uh, some of the, the, the images uh, on the Facebook page when, page when this episode drops. So, uh, mm-hmm. uh, so uh, you know, um, bef- uh, let's uh, go and listen to our Mike Grell interview. Do it. My name's Bond. James Bond. Bond. James. Bond, what do you think you're doing? The British hand up, sir. Welcome to James Bond Radio. News, reviews, and discussion for all things 007. Welcome to James Bond Radio, the comics of Bond. My name is Jack Lugo, and today I am joined by my fellow JBR00, Dan Gale. Say hi, Dan. Uh, hello, Jack. How are you? I'm okay. Uh, today we have a very special guest. Uh, he has a very distinguished career. He's been in comics for decades. Uh, he's worked on a lot of licensed properties, and he's also uh, created uh, his own um, characters as well, uh, his own series, such as uh, the Warlord and John Sable Freelance. And the reason we're talking to him today is because from 1989 to 1991, he was the writer and illustrator for both the License to Kill comic adaptation, as well as his own three-issue Bond original comic called Permission to Die. I'm talking about none other than Mike Grell. Welcome to the podcast, Mike Grell. Thank you for joining us. Hi, guys. Glad to be here. So, it's very uh, kind of you to join us. 
Yes. Um, yeah. It, 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 your comic, um, you know, and I meant to tell you this yesterday when I had you on the phone, your comic is like my favorite Bond comic that I've read so far. Um, you know, I think it holds up even today. Uh, so it's an honor to be speaking to you, sir. Thank you very much. I'm going to have to owe you the $2. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's, don't worry about that's that. actually about the, the second best compliment I was ever paid on James Bond. Uh, the first came from Raymond Benson who is the author of the James Bond Bedside Companion, as well as the ongoing uh, series of Bond novels. Uh, Raymond was uh, very kind to me. He said, and we always remember our best and our worst reviews, right? My best review ever. Uh, Raymond Benson said, Mike Grell's Permission to Die is the best James Bond movie I ever read. I, I agree nice. with him there. That's, I'll uh, take I mean, it. He, he, he is definitely uh, spot on with that. So, um, you know, kudos to Benson for coming up with that. And obviously, you know, uh, it's just an honor to be speaking with you. Um, so we normally start off um, our interviews with um, a round of quick fire questions about Bond. So this way our listeners can get to know you uh, and your taste in Bond. Uh, so let, uh, if you're ready, we can start that off. Sure, fire away. Okay, Dan, do you want to start us off? Uh, I can do, yes. Um, so, Mike, uh, can you tell us what is your favorite Bond film? On Her Majesty's Secret Service. Nice. Very nice. Yes. Why would you say that? Uh, it's got everything. Pushes all the buttons. The only thing that it was lacking was Sean Connery. Uh, if Connery had been in the role, uh, or if George Lazenby had continued in the role long enough to establish himself as Bond, I'm sure that people would be looking back today and say, yeah, best of the bunch. Um, it had terrific action. Mm. Uh, the directing was, was excellent. The script was tight. Telly Savalas as Blofeld uh, was, was very, very good. Uh, Diana Rigg, what's not to like? Um, uh, Louis Armstrong, we have all the time in the world. I mean, that's, that uh, alone had it. For me, when I read the books, which I read all the Bond books when I was in high school, um, that one really brought it 100% full circle. And if they had stopped the series right there, it would have been just fine, you know. Um, by comparison, I, I would have to say that uh, um, um, From Russia With Love, is another one of my all-time favorites, as well as Casino Royale. Um, but Honor Majesty's Secret Service, no question about it. I agree with you there. It's a, it's an excellent Bond film. Uh, so uh, question 002, um, you can, we can split this up if you want. Um, uh, it's what is your favorite Bond book? Now, most people will choose a Fleming book, but if you want, you can choose one Fleming book and one non-Fleming book. It's up to you. Oh, that's a good question. Um, Goldfinger was really excellent. Uh, the, it, this is going to sound really odd, but uh, I, I quite enjoyed The Spy Who Loved Me because it was written from a different point of view. Uh, there's a lot of speculation as to whether or not Fleming actually wrote it because it was such a departure. Um, Gilt-Edged Bonds, a collection of short stories that had uh, things like... Uh, the Hildebrand rarity that you never see, have, or at least we haven't seen it yet, show up in, in films. A View to a Kill was a, a, another one. Uh, the Living Daylights, you know, all included in that a collection of short stories. Yeah, but that's very right. nice. Yeah, I actually, I wrote a blog post uh, a while back ago about the, the Spy Who Loved Me novel. And uh, yeah, I mean, I think it's very underrated. Um, and it, you know, Fleming was experimenting with you know the story, you know his his craft at that time, and uh, yeah, it's it, it's it's definitely one that uh, you know is worth checking out for anyone who hasn't read it. So you know, definitely a great choice. Um, and obviously, um, yeah, Majesty's and and for much with love and don't think they're all great novels. Uh, so um, uh, question 003, um, who is your favorite Bond girl? Diana Rigg, no question about it. <laughs> <laughs> I I don't have her I don't have her photograph uh, behind me here unfortunately, but uh, if you uh, get a look at Mary, the lady of my life, um, 
when I first met her 30 odd years ago, she was a spitting image of Diana Rigg. I think we've, we know what side your bread is buttered. Uh, yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well done. Okay. That's good. Well done. That's great. It's, to be able to meet someone who looks like someone that you've always admired is, is only half the battle, but you know, if, if they're yeah, the person that, you want to spend the rest of the, your life, life with, that's, that's the, even the better. Fun, the, the, the funny part about that is that she tossed me over then, went off and married some other guy, but 30 odd years later, here we are together. Neither one of oh. us looks the way we did back then, but she always looked that way in my heart. Oh, that's a great story. Well, that's great. That, that proves it was meant to happen then. Absolutely. Yeah, excellent. Well, fantastic. Uh, if you had, uh, had to say who your favorite Bond actor was, who would that be? It's got to be Sean Connery. Um, Daniel Craig, a, a very close second. Okay, I can, I can uh, agree with you uh, with regards to... Well, I would say, hmm, my favorite is Dalton. I would say that, though, because I'm obsessed with his two films. Um, but I, 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 will, I will say that I, I do think that the Timothy Dalton was probably the best actor to ever have the role. Hmm. Yes. Uh, his, his acting skills were spot on. Um, in um, License to Kill and uh, uh, The Living Daylights, the, it was the first time you got the sense that Bond was really dangerous, that he was somebody yeah. you would absolutely not want to mess with. Uh, plus his dramatic range is just amazing. Mm. Very nice. But for whatever reason, for whatever reason didn't, didn't quite take off. Uh, and it's, it's Connery and obviously uh, Craig that have made the, the billion dollar Bond films. So you've got very good taste. Uh, I, I can't claim any credit for it at all. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'm interested in this uh, next question. Um, do you have an earliest Bond memory? Oh, yes. Uh, not the very earliest, but my fondest. Um, having read the uh, all the Bond books, uh, uh, starting uh, before... Uh, Dr. No came out, right? My oldest brother turned me on to those when I was probably 12 or 14 years old. Um, I had already read Goldfinger before the movie came out. And uh, two of my buddies and I were now seniors, I think, in high school, possibly juniors in high school, uh, went to see the, the Goldfinger and... Um, Bill and I had both read the book because I loaned him my copy. Uh, but uh, uh, another pal of ours, uh, uh, whose nickname was Buzzy, I won't use his full name because he went on to become a uh, senior vice president at IBM Corporation. But Buzzy was unaware of any of the dialogue that was coming up. And when Honor Blackman introduced herself <laughs> as Pussy Galore, Buzzy completely <laughs> fell apart. He laughed so hard and so long that the rest of the movie went on and Buzzy was still babbling to himself. His tears were rolling down his cheeks. Bill and I got up and we moved four rows back <laughs> to get away from him. And every time James Bond or, or Honor Blackman would say, Pussy <laughs> galore, <laughs> Buzzy would shriek all over again, and the whole audience would break up. It was probably the most fun I ever had in a James Bond movie. Uh, yeah, it's amazing to think that that almost didn't make it past the censors. Um, yeah, it's, it's amazing uh, to think <laughs> that it did make it past the censors. Yes. Yeah, so, <laughs> yeah, I just can't imagine that film with with that character with any other name. You know, it's it's uh, yeah. That, that, didn't they? Did they at one time suggest changing her name to Kitty? Yes, I believe so. Right, Dan. That's uh, what I've heard. Yeah. yeah, yeah, not the same uh, thing. They they go well, with it. <laughs> oh man, that, that's such a great memory. <laughs> uh, so, um, 
Uh, question 006 um, for the quick fire round. Um, do you have a bomb location that you would like to visit or if you visited one already, if you have a favorite bomb location? Wow. Um, gee, I'd have to say either uh, Piz Gloria or the Bahamas. One of the two. Okay, yeah, last year they, they actually did a reunion with uh, George Lazenby, uh, went uh, and they did a whole, uh, they did uh, some festivities to celebrate the 50th anniversary of Our Majesty's Secret Service. I wasn't there, uh, but uh, a, a couple of our co-hosts uh, were there. Uh, yeah, it just, it just looked amazing. Um, and the footage and the pictures I've seen just, uh, you know, uh, just look amazing. And uh, they recreated some of the scenes with George. It was, it was uh, pretty fantastic. Are there any locations that you have been to? Uh, whereabouts have you have you travelled around the world? Uh, no, apart from uh, your average uh, walking tours of London and Paris and places like that, um, I, I have not been able to visit any of the locations. Okay, well, that might still happen. Yeah, might mm -hmm. might still happen. Um, if if you had to say that you um, uh, you had a favourite scene. Uh, in in the entire series, in any of the films, what what would you say was your favorite scene? Wow, um, I would say um, the the final scene in Honor Majesty's Secret Service okay. has has got to be right up there. Um, I think the uh, ski chase sequence in that film was really excellent very very well done um that in the opening to um the spy who loved me uh where where he goes off the cliff and the and the chute opens with the union jack that was really impressive yeah definitely those are those are big favorites with uh, a lot of fans yeah uh so uh, what would you say was the most Bondian or spy-like thing you've ever done? Keep it clean. <laughs> or don't keep it clean. Or don't keep it clean, yeah. Be as yeah. filthy as you like. <laughs> it's all right. Uh, well, when, 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 I was, when I was in uh, the U.S. Air Force, uh, I was an illustrator, and I was assigned to an outfit that was a combined intelligence and uh, combat operations. And um, I was privy to a, a bunch of stuff during the Vietnam War and during the Cold War um, before I, I shipped over to Vietnam that um, is still officially classified under the Secrets Act. So I would say that's as close as I, <laughs> as close as I ever came. Uh, uh, yeah, I don't think yeah. it gets any closer than that, actually. Uh, probably not. Wow. You're bound by your own government to not talk about your own activities. <laughs> that's, that's pretty cool. <laughs> and actually, it, 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 this, this far down the line, uh, what they told me when, it, when I uh, left for Saigon, when I um, shipped out for Saigon, because I had the highest security clearance of any illustrator in all of Southeast Asia at the time because of the nature of the work that I did stateside. I was concerned about what happens if, if somebody drops a net on me and uh, uh, carts me off and begins uh, uh, shoving bamboo splinters under my fingernails. And uh, they said, don't worry, uh, there's nothing that you know that we're not going to change the second you out walk out the door, which includes the the, the combination to the men's room door. So, okay, there you go. <laughs> wow. Wow. Uh, so the final quick fire round question. Um, well, we've lost, we've lost Mike's video. Uh, is this, me, is yeah, my, my uh, computer's is having a, a glitch here. All All right, right, just me, a moment. Let me see if I can get you back here. Sure. Well, we, we can hear you. So that's the important thing. Yeah. I just okay. We, uh, okay. Let's, let's go final. I think we got you back again. There we there go. go. He's back. He should yeah, be back. Perfect. Yep. Excellent. Uh, so the final quick fire round question. Uh, do you have a favorite Bond theme song? Theme song? Yes. Uh, yeah, all the time in the world. I mean, okay, that's not exactly the, the theme song, 
um, but it's close, close enough to suit me. I think it's probably the, yeah. the best song ever. Oh, oh, wait a minute. Let me see. Um, may have misspoken. Sheena Easton, <laughs> uh, For Your Eyes Only. Okay. Okay. As a, as a proper theme song, because that was the, the actual theme song for the film, mm. um, I would say, yeah, For Your Eyes Only, but the, All the Time in the World is my favorite song from Bob. I like Fear Eyes Only. It doesn't get uh, as much love as it should, perhaps, but uh, it's got a, a lovely melody to it. So yes, I can, I can certainly. Yeah, it's the only time the the uh, singer actually appeared on screen uh, during the opening credits. Yes. And why not? I mean, Sheena Easton, Wabba Woo. She was amazing. Yes. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And it's an and it's a nice song. Um, um, okay, so um, I wanted to uh, start out by asking you, um, uh, was Fleming a big influence for you prior to you starting uh, writing the Bond comics? So um, I know it goes, it goes back a few years since you, since you wrote the comics. I know it was 1989. But prior to that, was Fleming a big influence for you? And it sounds like, uh, from your answers to the questions before, it sounds like he was. Uh, yeah, probably impossible not to have been an influence uh, on my writing, particular, particularly with uh, um, my Sable stories. Yes. Um, Sable was uh, originally conceived to be as far from superheroes as I could get at the time because I was just tired of drawing muscle-bound guys in skin-tight suits, and I wanted to do stories that were set in the real world. But I also gave Sable a, a very a strong international flavor. And uh, uh, I don't think you can help but be somewhat influenced by the writers who you admired when you were young, or when you first got interested in, in prose stories as opposed to comic books. Um, my, my writing influences are, you know, wide and varied from um, naturally Ian Fleming, uh, Mickey Spillane was always one of my all-time favorite writers. Uh, he said the difference between a writer and an author is that an author uh, is a guy like uh, Joseph Heller who writes one book and goes away for 23 years. A writer writes for a living. And uh, uh, I, I always had kind of adhered to that. Plus, he uh, had a, a method which was important and it came in handy for me in writing comic books is that he said he always wrote the last page first. When you're writing a murder mystery, you have to know where the story is going in order to know how it's going to end, right? Yeah, right. so you have a roadmap. And that was one of the one of the key things for me. So I would always write the the last, not the last page, the last chapter first. So I knew exactly where I was going. I had something to write up to. Um, as a, a young artist starting out, I worked with a lot of other writers who occasionally would write themselves into a corner. And how you could tell is that uh, they would get to page 23 of a 24-page book, and suddenly they would pile 9, 10, 11 panels on a page in order to finish out the story in the time that they had. So in, in my writing method, I was, I would always write the, the, know the ending before I started out, plot it out. So I had a, a page by page count. I could tell exactly where I was in my outline to make sure that I was on track. Uh, the other uh, strong influence in my early writing obviously was Edgar Rice Burroughs and Jules Verne. Um, mm -hmm. uh, and Ed Grace Burroughs for the um, obvious Tarzan. I, I did the Tarzan comic strip for a mm. while. Um, and uh, his pulp storytelling technique was just really great. His ability to create worlds and, you know, spin from the pure imagination was always really impressive to me. Um, and uh, Jules Verne, 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, and uh, uh, Journey to the Earth's Core, uh, were, or just excuse me, Journey to the Center of the Earth were my favorites when I was a kid. Just fantastic stuff. Yeah, I can understand that. Uh, on a sidetrack then, very quickly, because this is not a Tarzan podcast, but if you had to, uh, w w favorite screen Tarzan? What would you my favorite say? screen Tarzan? Yeah. 
Oh man. I just threw that that's, out there because I've no that no that 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 that's hard. Uh, as a kid, of course, I grew up with with Johnny Weissmuller. Uh, Gordon okay. Scott was was really quite excellent. Uh, mm. My favorite Tarzan movie is uh, one called uh, Tarzan's Greatest Adventure. Event, yes, where, yes, yes, yes. Where they actually Sean allowed him to speak English. Sean Connery was in it. Sir Anthony yeah. Quayle. I mean. You, it doesn't get much better than that. Uh, that that for me pushed all the buttons. So yeah, yeah. Well, I know British what I'm looking well. for tonight. <laughs> um, I, I oh, you got to see it. it. Yeah, I've got to see that now. Yeah, oh yeah, uh, there there are, there are two versions. There's a theatrical version that has a a, a bit more running time to it, uh, which I don't think you'd be able to find. Um, and uh, the the edited version that they did for a television broadcast, it's cut down to 93 minutes or something like that. Uh, and there's uh, one or two uh, relatively minor scenes that are cut out. Um, but it, uh, the effect of that was that it tightened it up a lot. Uh, there, you know, there's a number of films that that uh, even though it might sacrifice your favorite scene to it, um, uh, in my experience, once they edit down to a, a shorter running time, they cut out a lot of the garbage and it makes it a much tighter movie. This one is really, really good. You'll enjoy it. Yeah. All right. Yeah. So, um, getting back to um, uh, the uh, your Bond comics, um, can you tell us how you got involved in creating the Bond comics for Eclipse, uh, which I know is now defunct and obviously it hasn't been around for a while, and it's, and it's been a long time since you did them. Uh, but can you take us back to that time? And uh, you know, how did you get the job? Did you um, lobby to get it? Was uh, was someone? Did someone approach you and say you were perfect for the job? Actually, uh, I was approached by Acme Press out of London, uh, who was, uh, were, they were working with Eclipse as a co-publisher. Um, and I was hard on the heels of my run on the Longbow Hunters, Greed Era of the Longbow Hunters, which was very, very successful uh, for DC Comics. And uh, following my run on John Sable Freelance. So the, the combination of those made everybody prick up their ears and, and take notice of me. And they pretty much agreed that I was the right guy at the right time. So now, I'm sorry, Dan, which, which one came, from, well, which one came first? That's what I was going to ask. Actually. <laughs> yeah. Obviously we're, we're in synchronization. The, you mean the, the, the contact? So which you did, um, you did permission to die and you did um, the adaptation of license to kill. Uh, which one, yes. which one was first? Actually, I had begun Permission to Die before they approached me to do License to Kill. Right. Which, which is why all I did on License to Kill was the layouts and the, and the script. Okay. okay. So and I, that I, I, an worked, in... I was just going to say, and I worked with two other artists to finish it up. Yes, that had um, an interesting, uh, well, the, the, I guess the, the biggest concern with that one was um, not being able to use the likeness of the actor that was in the film. Can you tell us about some of the challenges that that uh, uh, threw up at you? It, it wasn't so bad because I had already done the design work for uh, Permission to Die. Okay. I had already I had already created the look of James Bond, uh, who I based on um, Ian Fleming's original model, which was Hoagie Carmichael. Um, somewhere, if you uh, look around on the internet, you'll find uh, a shot of James Bond uh, with a Walter P.P. K. in his hand, looking straight ahead. It's the front of his piece for the book. Uh, and uh, usually right alongside that, they'll show a photograph of Hoagie Carmichael leaning on a piano. And all I did was I, I bobbed about a half an inch off the end of Carmichael. There it is right there. there is, yeah. I took about a half an inch there off the is, end yeah. of Hoagie Carmichael's uh, uh, nose. I put the black comma over the right eye, and I gave him the scar, the, the, the so-called three-inch scar on his right cheek. Um, I didn't do the the standard 
uh, the, the way it's always been been shown uh, in in the comic strips, where he has this gash down his cheek because if you're a spy, I mean, good God, they had plastic surgery back then, you know, cover yeah. that darn thing up. Uh, but but if you're like me, my generation, we grew up in the age way before children were wrapped in foam rubber before they were sent outside to play. Uh, you know, we were told, be sure you come home before the street lights come on. And, and that was about it. Uh, uh, all of my friends, almost all of us have a scar in one eyebrow or the other. And in my case, it, it's in this eyebrow. Uh, and, and I, I saw it as, uh, as if Bond had been in a knife fight and somebody slashed at him and he flinched back and the knife caught him through the eyebrow and missed the eyeball and then just caught him on the cheek. So the total distance top to bottom would be three inches, but it's really two small scars and not necessarily that noticeable. Hmm. Now, when you're, when you were reading the Fleming books, um, you know, uh, did you envision Bond looking that way? Uh, Cause it's, it's kind of easy. Like now when I read the, you know, having been familiarized with, uh, with your comic, it's like, that's kind of the way I envision Bond now when I read the Fleming books. Uh, so I was just wondering about that. Uh, before I before I saw um, Doctor No, my vision of James Bond was Lawrence Harvey. If you okay. look him up, a distinguished British actor, uh, but he uh, he was slender. He had that same sort of angular face, uh, straight nose, uh, had had everything going for him. I mean, he he looked the the physical part. Um, with the except of the exception of muscular build, uh, he was very slender, uh, but uh, extremely gifted actor, and I always thought he would have been terrific as Bond. Um, so, in the, in the first issue of your comic, uh, it, it kind of it starts off with almost like a pre-title sequence, and you see uh, actually, you know, obviously you do notice, uh, you know, your your choice yeah. for his facial features, but Bond is also in a kilt, and I, you know, it's a tr tremendously great throwback to majesties um yeah so i just i just wanted yeah i mean did, was that you you know did you decide to to go in that direction to to have him in the kilt as like a like a little homage to majesties as, uh... absolutely uh my my intent with the with the whole series was to make it as cinematic as possible i have i was writing my own james bond movie as far as i was concerned uh, james bond movies have certain things that, that you expect you expect an opening title sequence an introduction to the character that's unexpected in some way to where he gets to do the bond james bond uh, uh routine um the the kilt was inspired by our majesty's secret service uh the the following sequences um where he wakes up in in bed with lady margaret uh and there's a a, a flashback montage of various scenes from the the various movies and um along with that um uh, there the other elements exotic locales beautiful women uh a, a world shattering plot and a really interesting Bond villain with a twist that you don't expect. And um, that, was, that was really the thing that I was striving for. I wanted to include all the things that I really enjoyed about all the, the great Bond films that I had seen. Uh, somebody asked me how come Bond fights uh, a, a gypsy, you know, it has a knife fight with the gypsy. It's because the fight in the gypsy camp in From Russia with Love was just so cool. I mean, yes. come on, right? What's, <laughs> not, what's not to like? Uh, I was given certain guidelines that I had to uh, maintain, for instance, not being able to use any of the actors' likenesses. Um, I worked my way around that by uh, ignoring bits and pieces, and including the the shots from in the mo in the montage uh i i did use the those actors but i was not allowed to use any of the bond actors I was not allowed to use um q 
because that was uh, a character who had been uh, created specifically for um, God. What was the film? Um, Thunderball, wasn't it? Well, um, well, yeah. Des- Desmond Llewellyn started in From Russia with Love as, as Q, um, and then uh, in uh, in Doctor No, it's a, it's a, it's a different actor. Um, but I guess you couldn't use Desmond Llewellyn's likeness uh, because I guess they, right. they referred right. to him as Q. Okay, and, and, but I was also not permitted to use Q. Okay. Oh, not you weren't able yes. to even call the. I, I was Q. not allowed to call him Q. So I used, uh, I used the name Boothroyd, called yes. Major Boothroyd, and I actually uh, modeled that character after Jeffrey Boothroyd. Mm. Oh yes, yes, I did. Yeah. Yeah. It does look like him. You've done very, you've done very well there. Thank you. Yeah, he's got the the, the little curly moustache uh, and everything. So yeah, that's a perfect uh, replacement if if you can't have uh, if you can't have Desmond Llewellyn. Uh, so if uh, if you um, were uh given that this was your own story but you were using elements um from that had been uh, influenced by some of the other uh, films in the past uh did you have to uh, ask permission to use these sort of things uh, is it is it seen as a homage if you set something in a gypsy camp for example or did you have to ask permission for that from um no, I, I, I didn't have to ask permission, but when I write a script, I always write full script. Actually, I write a, a full treatment to begin with. Right. Then, the, then the treatment is sent to the various editors um, who passed it along to Glidrose, and, and the Fleming people reviewed it. Then they reviewed my finished script. My script is... I always write full script. Uh, Page one, panel one, if there's a caption, the caption comes first, and then all the the details of the action, then all the dialogue uh, uh, attributed to each person broken down into various balloons. And that's because even when I'm writing my own material, I want an editor to review it and to have them able to look at my stuff and visualize exactly what I have in mind. Mm. Uh, it, it keeps me honest. And, and the only time that ever uh, played me false with uh, um, permission to die was that sometimes there are things in American English that don't translate into British English, English English, uh, uh, and, and vice versa. For instance, there was one scene where um, the, uh, there's a young lady who's trying to get Bond aside from a group of people in a casino to speak to him privately, and she does so by spilling a drink uh, on his jacket, and she drags him into the ladies' room, to, or into the men's room, into a restroom to you know, get him cleaned up. And as soon as they get in there, she's looking under the stall doors to make sure there's no feet. And in my scene description, uh, I, I wrote that uh, as she's doing this, Bond eyes her fanny appreciatively. <laughs> and I, boy, the, the, the wheels came <laughs> off on that one. <laughs> yeah, Glyn, Glyn Rose chimed in and went, uh, you, can't, you can't say that. <laughs> and now, even though it was only a scene description, right? It wasn't going to be in the dialogue or in the caption or anything like that. They said, you can't say that. And I, I didn't understand why. And of course, it turns out that uh, in British parlance, uh, a fanny a is a very particular meaning. part of a, yeah. a young lady's anatomy, uh, which is why you have belt packs and not fanny packs. There you go. Uh, well, I, I appreciated all the um, the, the commercial with love references. I mean, you have you even have Karen Bay's daughter, um, you know, uh, as a major part of the story. Uh, and uh, I, I loved what you did with her. Can you take us into um, developing that character? Uh, yeah, uh, because the the story is essentially split into three parts. I wanted I wanted each segment of the story to have a, 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 a strong 
character that Bond could play off of. And in this case, um, Lord help me, uh, after all these years, I cannot remember her name. But her uh, her character is, she's very, very strong-willed. Um, she's she's uh, uh, extremely attractive. She's got a, a few little uh, oddities and quirks, the, the broken nose and a crooked tooth and things like that, that uh, I, I always felt that... Um, Women who are too beautiful are unapproachable. So if you give them uh, some sort of a slight flaw, uh, a slight physical flaw, uh, perhaps uh, you might have a chance, right? So um, there, there was that. But I, I wanted to give her the, the strength of character that, that said that in the end, when... Um, She's facing down the uh, attack of a helicopter. Uh, she's standing, standing uh, behind the gun, and she's she's firing. She's firing away, and she what she's doing is she's fully prepared to sacrifice herself to allow Bond's mission to continue. And that sort of strength of character was something that I thought was really important to do. Uh, I hate movies where the the uh, typically in in most James Bond movies, I think you just lost me again. Um, the in most James Bond movies, you find that um, at the end, the the woman, as strong as she might have been, all of a sudden turns into a screamer. Uh, the the best worst example was um, uh, Grace Jones. Um, and when, yes. when, uh, yeah, at, at, Tanya at Robles. the end, right at, at the end of yes. the movie, um, she becomes nothing but a screamer. She's, uh, um, oh, yes, yeah, yeah. She, oh, James, oh, James. Yes. I mean, yeah, I, I have to think that that uh, Grace Jones would have really hated that part of the film. Um, and and for me, I I thought it was would be uh, doing the character a, a real disservice. So I tried to to make her uh, a, as as strong as possible, as independent as possible, and somebody who would be uh, not just a contemporary of Bond, but an equal to Bond. And then uh, continuing on with um, uh, the uh, other female characters uh, in the book. Um, uh, Edane, Edane Gaia. Yeah, who is the, right. Um, her character, uh, when, when you first meet her, uh, she's someone that Bond is trying to help escape from behind the Iron Curtain, uh, which for various reasons, um, when I began the story, the Iron Curtain was still very much in place. By the time the third book was published, it had fallen for, we'll get to that in a yeah. bit. Um, but I, I wanted to, to make her character more complex as well to where uh, at, at the beginning, Bond's perception of her is one thing, but by the end of the, the series, you realize that no, he's been wrong about her from the very start. Uh, she's, she's, the much less a victim and more of uh, a driving force behind this than anybody suspects. Okay. Uh, well, the um, the character name for Karen Bay's daughter, by the way, uh, is Luludi, I think Luludi, uh, which means flower uh, in your yes. story. And then uh, Karen Bay used to call her Botany. Botany. So, uh, yeah. That, oh, yeah. Right, yeah. right, right. Yeah. Oh, you know, you know why Botany Bay? Botany Bay. The prison colony. Yes. Oh, right. Yes, yes, yes. So there was a character in uh, Permission to Die that was very similar to Karen Bay, uh, Vavra. Yes. Um, uh, is it, um, is that, does that character, um, what, what does that character do with regards to the story? Um, why is it important that you have a, a, a character that, um, uh, uh, explains it, it, everything. Again, Why? Uh, his, uh, okay, his, the, the, there, there, are, there are 
two different ways of, of uh, to telling a story. You can, you can show everybody everything, or you can tell everybody everything. But if your hero has to tell everybody the entire plot, your hero becomes verbose and you spend more time explaining things. So if you have a secondary character who can explain things to the hero at the same time, you're explaining it to the audience and the hero doesn't come off sounding pedantic. Right. Okay. That's good. Yeah, I love the story that he tells in the gypsy camp about the wolf and the dog. Uh, there's a story that um, Robert tells about right. how right. Uh, the wolf saw that there was a well-fed dog. And, um, you know, the dog says, you could have those things too, you know, if you serve my master. And But then the wolf notices the collar around the dog's uh, neck and decides right. to go back in the forest. I mean, that's that, that's just great stuff. And, you know, great insight. It, it gives, just gives us great insight into this character who is a Bond ally. And uh, you see that a lot in the Bond films, but it's it's just really great to see. You know, it just adds a, an extra layer of richness to your story. It's it's uh, it's meant to apply to uh, uh, not just Vavra, but to Bond himself. Bond had, Bond has always had a choice, right? Uh, he would rather be wild and in and starve than to serve a master, than than to be confined in some way. Uh, the 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 gypsies, of course, had that that same sort of idea. Or, you know, back then they did. The the gypsy lifestyle has certainly changed from the time that I was a kid. Uh, I remember. Uh, growing up in, in northern Wisconsin, northern Wisconsin, about 100 miles north of Green Bay, uh, that uh, every year or so, a uh, gypsy caravan would come through, and they would, they would make the circuits. And uh, the word would go out to all the kids in town, whatever you do, don't go near the gypsy camp. You know, they steal little kids. Well, pfft. Five minutes later, down at the gypsy camp, half of the, half of the little boys in town are like, "Hey, take a, take us, right?" That's the surest way to get kids to do what you tell them not to do is to, you know, right? Take right. That yeah, approach, whatever yeah. you do, don't go, don't go near the gypsy camp. And and of course, you know, we, we, I was fascinated by by the the beautiful girls and the the bright colors and and everything else this is what we're talking in the 1950s here okay um so the that aspect uh, always had a very strong appeal to me i kept wishing that they would just steal me and take me away i used to say that uh uh my my True name is Zoltan the Magnificent, and I'm the rightful king of the gypsies until one day our caravan was passing through a small town in northern Wisconsin when they were set upon by a group of woodcutters where I was kidnapped and raised as one of their own, and they insisted on calling me Mike. <laughs> well, you had your own gypsy camp experience before even bonded. That's pretty amazing. Right. Right. So, so you, but, but you can probably then understand why that resonated with me uh, at, as a, a youngster, uh, as a teenager. Uh, I was only, I was only probably uh, six or eight years away from that experience at the gypsy camp, and I thought, oh man, this would be just so great. Um, did you do anything special to uh, get yourself into the, the rhythm of the dialogue, especially for those um, MI6 sequences where you know, Bond is talking to Anne and Money Penny? Because that, that dialogue also seems very spot on, and it does feel very much like I'm watching a Bond movie. Uh, again, having watched all the movies multiple times and, and read the books multiple times, it, it came fairly easy for me. Um, I, I think uh, in, in the back of my brain I always had the images of the actors speaking those lines as I was writing mm. yeah you can definitely feel that certainly uh, with the scenes with with Manny Penny there's some very nice flirtation going on there it does seem like it's it's taken straight out of one of the films which is wonderful one of the things you have changed uh, is is Bond's gun. You've updated the gun for some reason. That's that's now the gun that was in the John Gardner novels, isn't it? Is that right? Right. That, that's the transparent one. That's the reason for it. Um, 
some things I, I kept and some things I did away with. Um, I, I did feature the PPK uh, in the opening sequence, uh, if title sequence or whatever you want to call it, um, uh, in, the, in the opening action sequence. I did feature the PPK, uh, the ASP that he was using uh, throughout the rest of the book and uh, in the John Gardner uh, books was uh, a very particular, highly customized uh, version of a Smith & Wesson 9mm. This was in the days before there was such a thing as a compact 9mm. Um, so they, what they would do is they would cut this thing down from both ends, uh, uh, make the grip shorter, make the, the slide shorter, smooth it out, round it out. It's very distinctive looking, very classy looking gun, extraordinarily expensive back then um, in the neighborhood of $2,000. Uh, if you were, yeah, if you were trying to build that gun right now, you'd be looking at uh, 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 what $2,000 of, uh, 1989 money translates to uh, seven or eight thousand dollars right now, uh, but the fact is that now you can buy a compact nine millimeter, much more practical. In fact, Walter makes them, uh, and, and they switch the James Bond gun in the movies to the more contemporary version of the Walter. I still have a, a soft spot in my heart for the PPK, just because it's so cool. Very good. Um, you also um, have um, uh, like a two-person version of Little Medley. I mean, uh, spoiler alert, obviously, uh, you know, Bond rescues you, Dane. I don't think that comes as a surprise to anyone. Uh, but um, I thought that was a great touch, too, having, you know, the return of Little Medley. And uh, tell us how you came up with that idea. Actually, uh, that was uh, an item that was listed in the Sharper Image catalog. Oh really? <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, there's, there's uh, nothing in my book, uh, in in uh, permission to die, that isn't based in some fashion or another on something out of the real world. Uh, that that little helicopter was designed to run on hydrogen peroxide fuel. Uh, it was relatively inexpensive. You know, I'm like in the ten thousand dollar range, as opposed to however much a, a real helicopter costs. And uh, because it was very compact, um, I have no idea what the flight distance would have been. Uh, it it might have been only useful to the extent that like the 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 uh, Bell jet pack is useful. You know, got, got a flight distance of 250 yards or something like that, the length of a football uh, field. Um, but, um, you know, since it was it was listed there, I figured, what the heck, might as well, let's go for it. Uh, other things that, that, were, that were from the real world, um, the uh, um, rocket launching tube that is used in the third book, uh, was actually under development at the University of Washington uh, in uh, Washington State in Seattle. Um, and it was designed to put payloads into orbit from a fixed station. In other words, it would be built on the slopes of a mountain, uh, which since it couldn't be angled to different directions, it was not useful as a weapon Yes, right. You mentioned you know, that in the dropping, story. Too. Yeah, yeah, dropping a bomb in the same place over and over again does you no good, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but it was, but it would be uh, feasible to launch a payload into orbit uh, in a matter of hours instead of a matter of months. And um, they they had a, a a small working version of this thing that was built uh, at the university and it operated off of uh, a, a mix of oxygen and methane, where the the various chambers inside the tube were um, separated by membranes. The projectile itself had a piercing device on, on the end, like a sharp tip, and it it took the combustible mixture in at the front ignited it, pushed it out the back, and every 
section that it went through, it accelerated and accelerated and accelerated. Um, also during that, that time period, um, there was uh, under development a, a super gun that uh, was uh, developed by a, a British uh, gun designer uh, to uh, lob shells more than 100 miles. And for my purposes in this story, the distance between where they are in northern Idaho and um, um, uh, Vancouver Island, Victoria, BC, uh, is not that far beyond that sort of a range. And uh, that, was, that was his original, uh, his ultimate intended target. Wow. Yeah. I, so that was real. Oh, and, oh, and wow. also the, the, the submarine in the lake. The, oh, the really? Yeah. Oh, that, that, that's real too? <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, that's real. Um, I lived in uh, northern Idaho uh, um, just prior to that time. And uh, there's a lake there called Lake Ponderé. It's the largest freshwater lake west of the Rockies. In fact, outside of the outside of the uh, Great Lakes, it's the largest freshwater lake in the United States. It's 43 miles long and I don't know how many miles wide, but it's 1130 feet deep. And the Navy has a research, sonar research submarine in it. Oh, wow. Oh, yeah. Incredible. <laughs> if you, if you uh, were you given free reign to, to, to come up with any story you wanted, or were you told what, what you had to have in it? And if you, if you were allowed to come up with anything, how did you find out about all this stuff? This would have been pre-internet days. How did you go about researching about the, the, the kind of hardware that you were putting into your story? Uh, I think I think I might have mentioned uh, a, a military background that I had. So uh, some some of that is is carry over from things that I picked up along the way. Um, uh, anytime I'm doing a new project, uh, it's a, a huge educational uh, experience for me because I do a massive amount of research before I ever start. Uh, with respect to that particular aspect, um, I, I happen to um, have lived uh, in, on the shore of Lake Ponderé in northern Idaho, and I knew that uh, not so very far from where I lived at the time was uh, a gentleman uh, who did uh, some very interesting top secret government work who had an underground house on the shores of the lake and who traveled back and forth by helicopter piloted by a very striking six foot tall blonde lady. Um, and so I, I, I incorporated all of that as far as the rocket motor uh, launch tube uh, came, uh, that was something that had been featured in the uh, Seattle Times newspaper not long before I, I did that that story. And everything else was uh, bits and pieces of inspiration. Uh, the, the ultimate villain, uh, uh, Eric Weislow, I that's how I'm going to pronounce it because nobody's corrected me on it, um, is based on a combination of Captain Nemo and the Phantom of the Opera. Uh, wow. the, the, the kicker there being that um, he does wear the mask like the Phantom, but everyone, when the mask finally comes off, expects to see that he's horribly scarred, and he's not because all the scars are on the inside. Mm -hmm. Uh, there. Uh, speaking of the villain, there's, there's um, definitely um, you know there's always that trope of like the villain having like the, the motivation of wanting to do something for the betterment of mankind, and obviously not realizing well he realizing that there is devastation involved, but willing to sort of you know carry on and uh, regardless of the like, human sacrifices, um, you know. And uh, I mean, when you get to issue three, you learn more about that the that the Gisaldo or um, you. You, you you find out more about what what's driving him, and um, yeah, I just wanted to, yeah to 
um, see if you wanted to uh, go into more about what it took to sort of develop that character and his motivations, like, uh, you know, the motivation of, you know, destroying sure. some place. To, sure. And, the, 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 the standard Bond villain has always been a megalomaniac, uh, bent on world domination, uh, destruction, of uh, monetary gain, something or other. Um, and I wanted to make this character dramatically different uh, in, in a fashion that would catch readers by surprise. Uh, in, instead of being someone who is uh, bent on destruction for destruction's value point of view, uh, for, for the point of destruction alone, um, his driving force is that he wants to put an end to these wars. He wants to wake the world up from the Cold War where we are on the verge of blowing up every, everything, killing everyone. And he prepares to do it by launching a nuclear attack on Victoria, B.C., um, he, he chooses it for several reasons. Number one, capital city. Number two, um, the location on an island. Uh, it means that the the scope of the devastation of the destruction will be rather limited. Uh, perhaps a quarter of a million people instead of millions and millions of people. Um, but it will be a hell of a wicker upper. And he also knows that in the process of doing this, he is going to be branded as the worst villain terrorist in history. And that's part of the sacrifice that he's willing to make in order to stop people from destroying the rest of the world uh, through their wars. Um, it was it was sort of um, uh, not serendipity because that's a that serendipity is a, a a happy circumstance, but it was a kind of confounding really um, for me that I had written and drawn this story so long in advance. Uh, but the third book sat in the can for more than a year before it was published because Eclipse Comics, uh, as you mentioned, now defunct and for really good, that. yeah, for really good reasons. Um, they had alienated all of their printers and they apparently hadn't paid their print bill for a very long time. So there was no one who was willing to print this book for them. And so uh, it sat in the can for over a year before they finally were able to uh, show that they had orders in enough to cover the cost and they had to agree to give the, the printer first money uh, as before it was uh, distributed. So the, the book finally came out after the Iron Curtain had fallen, after, after the dissolution of the Soviet Union even. Um, so we had to sort of hurriedly write in a, a caption at the at the end that covered that aspect. Um, I'm not real pleased with that, but oh well, uh, take what I can get. Yeah, I, I, it still works for me. I mean, it's a it's a work of fiction, so obviously it just takes place in its own you know reality, and it's um, you know uh, I mean obviously I'm reading it years later, but I can imagine the frustration of readers who were reading it at the time, waiting for that third issue to come. Mm. Uh, yeah, I, I, think, I think if you, if you read it now, um, it, it's probably less jarring to see that, that um, ending come the way it did um, because you're looking back at it from an historical viewpoint. You, know, you read it now, it's a period piece. Just like, you know, from Russia with love, you don't expect uh, um, anything from it but what it is. Um, it, it taken, taken in the context of the times uh, and from the, the viewpoint of 
the distance of time now, I think it stands up pretty well, even with a little quirky ending. I never found out what the ending was, because although I got uh, issues one and two, I never found issue three, so I, I still don't know how it ends. So Darth I'm... Vader is Luke Skywalker's father. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. Yeah, we just spoiled the entire comic book. <laughs> <laughs> Damn. Um, I, did, I did pick up the License to Kill adaptation, um, and I was interested to know how that... I mean, this is as a film, obviously uh, a lot more grown up, a lot more adult than some of the films that had come before it. Um, did you have to take that into account when you're adapting it as a, as a comic book? Because presumably I was, the, the, I was, the I was actually fairly young. Yeah, I was actually given the, the uh, uh, first draft shooting script. Right. So uh, I, I had that uh, to work from for my reference and a ton of uh, reference photos. Uh, uh, blessedly, uh, the, the character portrayed by Wayne Newton uh, or Wayne Newton himself, that whole sequence was missing. He's um, not in this, is he? No. Yeah, it, as was, uh, for the <laughs> most part, that ludicrous sequence at the end of the film where... Um, a bond is fighting um, with uh, Benicio del Toro's character oh, oh, in, the, in the yeah the, in the in the in the warehouse where the or the factory where the cocaine is being ground up, and the air is just full of white dust. I mean, those guys would have been high as kites. <laughs> yeah, I noticed that too because uh, Dario actually doesn't in the, in your comic doesn't come in until later until the barroom fight scene love the scene that ends with the, the bar room site fight uh and he and he doesn't uh, he's not one of the ones who uh uh who, who kills stella at the beginning um or violet stella at the beginning uh so that that moon that that line uh you gave her a nice honeymoon actually goes to sanchez in your, in your comic adaptation the uh the, I, I think probably the the reason for that is that when when you're Starting out in a, in a film, um, it, the the writer has an idea of what's going to happen, and he basically puts it down on paper. And then, as uh, actors are assigned to the role, you go, "Hey, wait a minute! You know, this character with this actor, this could be so much more." So you write him a bigger part, give him something bigger, more important to do uh, along the line. Um, I can't imagine uh, Benicio del Toro even then uh, wanting uh, 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 a part where he's just you know five minutes on and off. You know, you you have to give them something to attract them to the role. And once you discover the the quality of the actors that you're working with, then they bring something extra to the the equation as well. So in an effort to accommodate them, I think that that's where changes like that occur. And then somewhere along the line, somebody must have realized, hey, we're shooting in Las Vegas. Let's get the biggest name star in Las Vegas to be one of our co-stars. And they, they got him, Wayne Newton. Yeah. No. <laughs> no. I've got to say, Wayne Newton is uh, is not a name that I knew outside of License to Kill because he's he's not very well known over here. Um, but the more I hear about him, the more fascinating that man uh, becomes. He, he's had uh, quite a history, and I urge people. To oh yeah, his, his, his back yeah, story. Yeah, he was he was a he was a um, uh, a singer, very popular singer, child star. Now he had had a song called Donkishin. Don Kishin, darling Don Kishin, from well, I think he was 13 or 14 years old. And uh, he's got uh, amazing musical chops. Uh, you know, uh, uh, I can't tell you how many different instruments the guy can play. And he literally became Mr. Las Vegas. Uh, they signed him uh, to do X number of shows per year for mega millions of dollars at the casinos. And um, if you if you think about the kinds of crowds that Vegas was drawing in the 60s, 70s, okay, say the 70s and 80s, a lot of those were older 
folks, older couples, who probably remembered Wayne Newton from when he was uh, a young star. And uh, that's why that's why uh, the other headliners of the times were uh, Frank Sinatra, Sammy Davis Jr., Dean Martin, you know, the, the Rat Pack, all of those guys. Uh, you're playing to your core audience. These days, I have no idea what what uh, Vegas's core audience is, but uh, I'll bet it's not Wayne Newton and <laughs> Frank Sinatra anymore. Um, yeah, we also noticed in your License to Kill application that the end, it ends with Pam sort of embracing uh, Bond at, uh, after he's uh, eliminated Sanchez as the writer. Uh, and you don't have that Dino Ma at the end that's in the film where, you know, Bond chooses between Lupe and, and, uh, and Pam, and then you have the pool and the blinking fish. And I actually feel like um, the tighter ending where you don't have all that extra, st the, the extra stuff um, actually works better. Um, uh, but then, you know, and you also have that giddy lighter, um, you know, Felix Lighter's recovering and he's all giddy, um, you know, telling Bond about uh, and contacting him, uh, wanting him back and all that. Yeah. Um, uh, so I feel um, like, yeah. Bond, Bond uh, movies are one of the few that I think the, the denouement actually works because it's something that, that sets you up for the next film. Um, and, and they've been pretty religious about that uh, as, as time has gone on. Um, I remember in, in the early days, uh, they made it a point that whatever Bond girl you saw in one movie, she was generally in the picture of in, during the next one, at least in, in the, uh, most of the Connery films, with the exception of uh, Honey Rider. Uh, but we we did see um, got her can't remember what her name is. Oh, Sylvia Trench. Yeah, Sylvia Trench. Yeah, yeah Sylvia Trench makes a, a another appearance. So there's there's that that little continuity uh, in between the two. Um, my my personal uh, approach to storytelling is that when the story is over, it's over. Uh, in particular, if it's uh, a suspense or a mystery, once once the mystery is solved and the suspense is broken, unless there is a reason to go on, like um, if you're if you're writing a, a, a continuing series, then you have a reason to plant the seed for something else. But um, for me, when it's over, it's over. Uh, there's a very popular writer, Michael Crichton. Uh, who uh, uh, wrote Jurassic Park, uh, Andromeda Strain, Westworld, and everything else. Um, for me, the, the single flaw in Crichton's books is that when the story is over, he has a tendency to write three more chapters to explain to you things that he should have explained so that you would understand it when the story is actually over. Uh, Mickey Splain always said, the first page of your book sells that book. The last page of the book sells your next book. And Spillane used to try to delay the reveal until that absolute last moment of the last page. And in one case, he actually got it down to the very last word. And he was very proud of that. But that was an wow. exercise for him. Yeah, I, I enjoy those Mickey Spillane novels too. Yeah, it, it is, you know, from a, from a distance of time, uh, like I was saying before, you have to take it uh, in, in the context of the history of the times um, and, and read them with that very much in mind. Because uh, going back and, and reading the Mike Hammer novels, no, they, they don't hold up uh, today, but, but for what it was at the time, man, they sure were exciting. So um, can you tell our listeners uh, what projects you're working on currently so um, we can check that out? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, we just uh, finished our first Kickstarter for Maggie the Cat. Uh, Maggie the Cat is, uh, um, uh, she's a, basically, she's a lady cat burglar, uh, originally intended to be uh, sort of a female type of a James Bond, but uh, over the, the time period, the course of time that I've been working with that character and developing a screenplay, um, she's become far more complex than that. Uh, uh, started out with 
uh, lots of overtones of Ian Fleming, and now it's much more Hitchcock. Um, oh, nice. the, yeah, the, the, the characters have grown and developed like crazy. Uh, she first made her uh, appearance in the pages of John Sable Freelance. Um, she's an American model who marries into uh, a landed British gentry, thinking that she was going to live a fairy tale life like Princess Grace, and she winds up far more like Princess Di, uh, haunted by the press. The, She's got a philandering husband who manages to kill himself in a car wreck with his latest mistress, and he leaves her penniless, uh, with the exception of uh, a ramshackle ruin of a Scottish castle uh, that she is uh, uh, running as a, a as a bed and breakfast with the uh, aid of uh, her attendant, uh, a butler by the name of Angus McCallan, who is uh, himself um, a former burglar. Uh, he he was once a he was once a uh, uh, stage magician, but he figured out that there's a lot more money in cracking safes than escaping from them. Uh, now he acts as uh, Higgins to her Eliza Doolittle, uh, polishing her rough edges and coaching her, training her to become uh, a, a, a very skilled cat burglar. Mm -hmm. uh, her goal is to steal back all the jewelry that her ne'er-do-well husband has given to all of his many mistresses over the years. Uh, but in doing so, she falls uh, a fall of uh, British intelligence and is pressed into service to work with the SAS to uh, track down and bring to justice a terrorist mastermind before he can pull off his final masterpiece. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's, that's uh, um, we've completed that. Um, and we're getting ready to launch uh, the second part, uh, I think probably by the end of the summer. Uh, in addition to that, uh, I'm uh, going to be launching a, uh, another Kickstarter to fund omnibus editions, oversized omnibus editions of John Sable Freelance, oh. collecting uh, the entire run of my series in either three or four volumes. So they'll be uh, very, very thick volumes, not the sort of thing that you'll be reading in bed um, or probably not in the bathroom either. Uh, and uh, uh Aside from that, I have, um, uh, let's see, uh, DC Comics is reprinting my uh, runs on um, Green Lantern, Green Arrow in omnibus form, along with Green Arrow, The Longbow Hunters, which includes 50 issues of my run on the Green Arrow series, 1,530 some odd pages long, and that's going to be out this summer. And rumor has it that they're going to follow that up with uh, the Warlord, an omnibus on the Warlord. But that's just rumor at this point. Uh, I have my fingers crossed. And in the meantime, filling, filling in the, the, the gaps uh, during uh, quarantine and everything else with uh, um, a, a few heavy commissions and um, – uh, keeping up uh, pitching screenplays. I have sc finished screenplays for Sable, Maggie the Cat, Shaman Steers and Bar Sinister, and another project that hasn't been announced yet, but it's coming up. Okay. Very cool. Now, uh, if anyone wants to um, uh, j uh, join the Kickstarter, where can they go? Uh, check out, uh, you can, you can, Initially, uh, check in with my webpage, mikegrell.com, and the announcements will be there as soon as they as soon as they come up. Uh, beyond that, there is a, a Mike Grell fan page on uh, uh, Facebook, and uh, everything will be uh, posted up there. Um, you can't ask me how to get there because I'm not on Facebook. <laughs> well, neither is Dan. Dan is not on Facebook either. either. <laughs> good, good, good for you, Dan. Good for you, Dan. Know that. Um, yeah, no, I, I do not do Facebook. What's the? Uh, you've got an amazing piece of artwork behind you at the moment. Uh, uh, an angel. What have I got is here? That, is that? Was that oh. some of your own work? 
Uh, yes, as a matter of fact, uh, let me see if I can get this turned around just a, a tiny touch. That is um, part of a project that is near and dear to my heart. Um, uh, years ago when I was uh, at, at ends uh, a bit, uh, let's say, uh, uh, wondering what my next step should be and uh, looking for inspiration. And I woke up one night with a voice speaking in my ear and it said 100 angels. So apparently I'm supposed to paint 100 angels and that's, that's one. Mm -hmm. Right. They are just for your own, your 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 own uh, private use, or are you, um, would they be included in a, in a project somehow, or would they be sold individually? I'm I'm, I'm hoping I'm hoping uh, to uh, do some sort of a project with them. Um, I I what I would honestly like to see is a series of prints that would uh, go out to uh, people who um, receive new homes from Habitat for Humanity. Mm -hmm. uh, everybody needs a guardian angel in their home. And uh, I think, think it would be a, a, great a great spot to do these. Yeah. Um, it's, it's one of those things, uh, not, not for the greater glory of Grell by any means. <laughs> Well, I've noticed that in in some of your uh, in in permission to die and in, in the in the, uh, the the back cover, um, uh, you've been using uh, pencils and you've been using uh, what looks maybe charcoal and presumably there's uh, uh, all sorts of uh, inks and goodness knows what else. What are what as an artist? What are your favourite sort of mediums? What are the ones that you go for? Uh, if I hit. If I had to throw away everything else in my studio and keep one thing, I'd keep a pencil. Mm -hmm. I love the pencil. Um, I, in fact, most of my work on Sable uh, over the years, beginning with issue number 19, uh, has been reproduced from pencil. Uh, I find that I, I, can, I can do something with a pencil that will look like ink, uh, uh, today with the, the Photoshop, even the meager Photoshop skills that I have, I can take a finished rendered pencil drawing and turn it into something that looks like ink in about 10 minutes. Uh, now the, the, there's plus and there's minus to that. The, the plus is that you save all that time on inking. Uh, the minus is that the technique doesn't translate real well to superhero comics where you re really need those dense, bold blacks and, you know, those sharp accents and stuff like that. So I, I still uh, ink all the superhero stuff. Uh, but um, uh, for uh, Sable and, and things of that nature, a lot of my work is uh, still or reproduced solely from pencil. Um, the, the paintings and things that I do are generally mixed media to the point of being anything that falls to hand. Um, you know, most often I, I start with uh, a pencil drawing and then work over that with uh, a glaze of either watercolor or uh, water-based oil paints. Um, and, and it can it can include charcoal, it can be chalk, it can be acrylic, it can be watercolor, uh, just anything that gets the job done. Um, with uh, in, in my past experience, I mean, my, my background is in uh, commercial art, although uh, being an illustrator in the Air Force, I, I learned that uh, the important thing is to do the job, do the work, get it done on time. Um, commercial art, you never have a chance to go back and redo everything from scratch. Someone once asked me, what do you do with all your scraps? And I said, what do you mean by scraps? He said, you know, the stuff that doesn't work out. I said, you find a way to make it work. I, in one instance, uh, I was inking uh, the splash page for uh, Star Slayer number two, when uh, my soon-to-be ex-wife walked into the studio, bumped my table, and knocked my ink bottle 
off and it rolled across the page and turned the entire page black. And I sat back just shocked. And she said, is that waterproof? And I said, not until it's dry. <laughs> and I grabbed it, ran to the bathtub, turned the faucet on full blast, ran it under the faucet and all of the ink came off except for a few little streaks, which I turned into some special effects on the page. It's, you know, waste not, want not, right? Mm -hmm. And then, of course, there was, there was the time that I fell asleep while I was inking. Uh, I fell asleep, but my hand didn't. And <laughs> I, my, my pen kept moving until I had what looked like a, a, a ball of snagged fishing line at the, at the end of a streak that went partway down the page. And it took a while, but I found a way to incorporate that into the page design. Nice. I like that. We had uh, on the uh, podcast a couple of uh, weeks ago now, um, Jack interviewed uh, Alan J. Porter, who wrote the book, um, The History of the Illustrated 007. And there's a, a little bit about you in there. And there's that image. Yeah, how about that? Here. This image that is, is one of yours, um, it's on page 19, 15, or page yeah. 15. So I don't recognize that image. Where is that? Was that used in pu for publicity or was it in one of the issues? No, that was, that was actually a, a commission. Oh, wow. That, yeah, someone commissioned uh, somewhere early 90s. Right. Okay. Oh. And I think there's a second one, right, Dan? Uh, now, there was another one, and I, I wasn't sure if this even was yours but uh because it was it was very different yes now that one that one there Can not you mine see that yeah no, that not mine yours? okay not mine i didn't i wasn't sure it's it said it said you were in the uh in the small print but yeah, i thought i'd better check um but uh yes that's that's very interesting because uh, that's that looked like a pencil drawing um and yes it would have been obviously Yep. If you're doing if you're doing uh, something like uh, a, a book like um, Permission to Die, presumably it um, it just says here writer and artist. So um, I'm assuming in most other cases, someone else would do the pencil, someone else would do the ink, someone else would do the colours, someone else would do the lettering. And but it seems on this one you did everything. Is that right? I did not do the colouring or the lettering. But okay. I yeah, I wrote it and I did all the pencils and inks. Right. Okay. Hmm. Uh, is that a union thing? Is there a reason why sometimes? I uh, know. Else... Uh, in fact, in fact, uh, the reason why it it's not properly credited like that is because there is no such thing as a union in comics. Um, in, in general, though. Um, because the production of a comic is, it, it's all piecework, all right? Page by page, you get paid, paid page by page. Um, and the, the production schedule has to be so tight in order to produce a monthly comic book. In general, it's been broken up into segments. There are very few people who write and draw, uh, write pencil and ink their own material, very few. Uh, at, at that time, there was me and Jack Kirby and probably Walt Simonson, and I can't think of who else would have been doing it all by themselves at the time. Uh, Bernie Wrightson, possibly, mm -hmm. uh, although I, I'm not so sure that Bernie wrote his own material. Uh, it was more adaptive. Um, not, not a lot of people doing the whole thing. Howard Chaikin. Uh, right, uh, right, draw, you know, pencil link, uh, the entire thing. Um, it's for, for me, it's uh, uh, a, a case of I, I think I'm, I'm better off inking my own stuff. Uh, I had some bad experiences with inkers over the years, uh, and uh, um, I'm, I'm much more content inking my own material, although. Uh, with Meg the cat, uh, excuse me, with a, a new project. I should have mentioned this before. Um, another project that we have uh, coming out here, uh, we just completed a, a, a project, a Kickstarter uh, for the Pilgrim, 
uh, which began about 10 years ago. We only got two issues out before uh, the company that uh, was sponsoring us publishing uh, fell afoul of the, the crash of uh, the, you know, the, the, the last Great Depression or recession. Um, and uh, now Mark Ryan, who is uh, the creator writer on this, uh, he's the fellow who does the voice for Bumblebee, Jet Fire, and Lockdown in the Transformers movies. Uh, he's a star of Robin of Sherwood, played Nazir, um, stage, screen, television. Uh, on stage, he was in the original cast of Evita and was nominated for the Olivier Award for Elmer Gantry. Uh, he starred in uh, Black Sails on the Stars Network. Mm -hmm. And uh, he's a man, man of many skills and talents. Um, we had gotten so far as the, the third issue was uh, penciled and half inked. And because I'm embroiled in my own projects, when Mark decided to relaunch the Pilgrim, uh, I needed to look around and find someone to do the finishes uh, off of my pencils for that last half of the third story. And uh, the first name that came to my mind was my buddy Steve Scott, Stephen B. Scott, who, um, among other things, worked on Batman, um, uh, Wolverine, uh, Neil Gaiman's The Graveyard Book, uh, a bunch of stuff, uh, Normandy Gold most recently. Um, and Steve is just an incredible, uh, very, very gifted artist in his own right. And because he's a buddy, he was willing to jump in on this while I'm embroiled in everything else and help out with, uh, with the inks. And uh, we're going to continue on with the completion of the Pilgrim story uh, where I'm going to do layouts uh, or at least breakdowns and Steve is going to do all the finishes on it. So that's going to pay off really, really well. But apart from that, uh, over the years, the reason that I turned to inking my own stuff was that I had a very negative experience when I was working uh, on The Warlord, uh, working with an inker by the name of Vince Coletta, who... Um, Vince was fast. I'll give him that. And you never missed a deadline. Uh, even if I was behind, Vince would catch up. Uh, so he can't get all the blame for it. But working with him was so negative that it got to the point where I really no longer cared what I put down on paper. And that was disastrous for me. So ultimately, I withheld one story and I inked it myself and that how, that's how I was able to break his lock on the book and get a new anchor on it from that point on I made it a point to ink my own stuff whenever possible and I still do okay um well I don't want to um uh, I have to start wrapping things up because uh, I'm actually getting a notification that my uh, my battery's low even though I have it plugged in so uh, I don't mean to cut everything <laughs> short but uh, I want to make sure we get everything recorded. Uh, so before we let you go, um, if you were doing a Bond comic today, what would you do? Wow. That would be so great. Uh, I, you know, I, I would love to take a crack at an all-new story. I've got a couple of things squirreled away, always. Um, always looking uh, down the road to, to the future. Uh, I, I have a, um, uh, an idea of, for one that would be a, a good one. I'm not going to tell you what it is, uh, but obviously it involves beautiful girls and an earth shattering plot. Um, I, I also would not, would not mind at all, uh, doing an adaptation, a straight adaptation of one of the, the actual bond stories. Um, I think a comic adaptation of Honor Majesty's Secret Service would be fantastic. That would be great. All right. So um, thank you for taking the time to join us uh, today. I really appreciate it. I'm sorry I had to cut it short a little bit, but, um, but you know, I really uh, appreciate the time you've taken, and you've really been very insightful. So thank you. Yeah. You're welcome. And if you have any follow-ups or anything like that, just give me a holler. Look I forward to doing this again sometime. Thank you so much. All right. Thanks very much, Mike. 
Cheers. Cheers. Nice to talk to you. Bye. Bye. So that was our interview with Mike Grell. Um, I had a fantastic time. Did you, Dan? He's a very interesting person, isn't he? He's he's he does his research. That's what that's what impressed me when he he gets his teeth into a, a job. And this would have been long before you could just Google up, you know, bits of equipment or different types of machinery or different um, weapons or you know all the history of the places that he would have. Uh, set his story he would have had to have gone there he would have had to have known about them and uh, that shows great commitment yeah he put he he did a lot of meticulous research into creating those comics and creating you know finding out about the the, the, the gadgets and the equipment that uh, played into the plot um, you know um, and he's just a fantastic guy mm. so um, I'm just glad we got to, to talk to him today I don't know about any of his other work so I, I need to, to do my research and, and have a look because he's done so much stuff. Yeah, he has. Um, yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm interested in the John Sable freelance um, books that he did. Um, those he started even before he did the Bond comics. Um, and then he also talked about a little bit about the current project that he's doing, uh, Maggie the Cat, which uh, sounds uh, very interesting as well. Mm, it does. It's got, it sounds like it's got a, a little mixture of, um, there's a lot of Bond and a lot of, uh, um is a bit of because it's superhero based and having a butler it's kind of batman like yeah um, not qu- not quite the hero but an anti-hero because it's a thief but you know getting revenge and getting back what she does she's uh, has a right to own her, her family fortune uh yeah it sounds quite intriguing yeah 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 so um, I hope everyone had a great time listening. Um, I certainly did. Uh, so that about wraps it up for today's episode of uh, James Bond Radio, the Comics of Bond. Thank you for joining us, uh, Dan. I really appreciate you. It's my uh, pleasure. Thank you for on. asking me. Um, so we, we have to have you back. Um, and uh, until next time, James Bond Radio, the Comics of Bond will return. Bye. Bye. <laughs> Hope you enjoyed the show. Good night.